Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to uh, Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about some things that matter to me. I think uh, maybe should matter to you, too. Any comments, questions, reactions can always be sent to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there or or you can leave a comment there if you like. Uh, as always, if you do email me, please include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam. And uh, be a little patient. I do answer my mail, but um, I'm actually kind of slow about dealing with email. So, but you will get an answer. All right. Any event, starting off with a little yin yang this week. Uh, some bad news, good news deals for you. Uh, the first of them, our bad news, good news things, is that, uh, well, it's becoming commonplace for employers to demand that you let them uh, check out your credit history before they'll consider whether or not they'll hire you. In fact, a recent study by the organization Demos cited a survey of um, human resources professionals, which revealed that nearly half of companies today demand credit checks as a requirement for hiring of some, or even in some cases, all of their positions. And this is not just high-level management. Quoting the Demo study, this is a quote, even a brief look at a popular job listing website reveals that employers require credit checks for jobs as diverse as doing maintenance work, offering telephone tech support, assisting in an office, working as a delivery driver, selling insurance, laboring as a home care aide, supervising a stockroom, and selling frozen yogurt. Now, the credit reporting industry obviously has a vested financial interest in this in convincing employers that paying for credit reports is a good, even a necessary, self-defense against employee theft or fraud. The trouble is, the argument doesn't wash. The industry's uh, PR flax will insist that living beyond one's means is a red flag for potential employee theft. But as anyone living in the real world can tell you, being in debt or having a troubled credit history nowadays has little of any connection to living beyond your means. It's much more likely to have a connection to long-term unemployment or a health crisis, or as happened in the case of my family, a health crisis leading to long-term unemployment. In fact, a representative of TransUnion, this is one of the three big credit reporting companies, they admitted that they, and this is a quote, don't have any research to show any statistical correlation between what's in somebody's credit report and their job performance or their likelihood to commit fraud. In other words, this is all a waste of time and money. So why do employers do it? Well, some do it, I expect, because they fall for the industry BS. Some do it because it's an easy way to winnow down the field of applicants for a position, one that doesn't require them to actually think or actually make any decisions. And frankly, some do it because they can, because it's a way of demonstrating their power over you, their ability to make you submit to their demands as a condition of having work. Now, whatever the reason is in a particular case, the end result is that the practice is not only racially discriminatory because people of color are more likely to have problems with their credit history than others, but uh, the practice also creates, as uh, well, this way Demos put it, uh, it creates an untenable catch-22 for job seekers. They are unable to secure a job because of damaged credit and unable to escape credit and improve their credit because they can't find work. The good news here is that there is some pushback on this, finally. Six senators, led by Elizabeth Warren, have introduced the Equal Employment for All Act, which would make it illegal for employers outside of national security jobs to require that job applicants disco uh, disclose their credit history. Warren called credit checks one more way the game is rigged. A game, that is, where relatively common life events, such as well, a divorce, an illness, a period of unemployment. Um, these will have a much greater negative impact on the credit rating of a middle class or poor person than they ever will on the credit rating of a rich one. 
She also said the act is about basic fairness and that people should be able to compete for jobs based on their merits, not on whether or not they already have enough money to pay all their bills. Now, Warren has no illusions about the prospect of this bill passing or that if it does, it will affect any large number of people. In fact, the number of people that it will benefit is probably kind of small. However, that does not make the practice that the employers are doing any less heinous, and it doesn't make opposition to that any less a good place to stand. Okay, our second of our uh, bad news, good news deals has to do with guns. Uh, the bad news. On January 6th, U.S. District Court Judge Edmund Chang ruled that the city of Chicago's ban on the sale of guns within city limits is unconstitutional. Chang said in his ruling that he understood that Chicago enacted the gun sale with the aim of safeguarding the residents, calling that one of the fundamental duties of government. He even acknowledged, and I'm quoting him, the stark reality facing the city each year is thousands of shooting victims and hundreds of murderers convicted with a gun. However, he also said, quoting again, on the other side of this case is another fundamental feature of government. Certain fundamental rights are protected by the Constitution, but outside government's reach, including the right to keep and bear arms for self-defense under the Second Amendment. Now, the reference to self-defense is particularly depressing because it indicates that at least some lower courts now are embracing a wide view of the Supreme Court's Heller and McDonald decisions, which were in 2008-2010 respectively. Heller uh, is one you probably heard of, and this was the first time, Heller was the first time in U.S. history that the Supreme Court had somehow dug out of the Second Amendment an individual right to self-defense, finding that a meaning and in fact a purpose of the Second Amendment. Again, it was the first time in U.S. history that any court had done this. The suit in question in the Chicago case was brought by three Chicago residents and, significantly, the Illinois Association of Firearms Retailers, who are eagerly anticipating a whole new market. Now, the case wasn't a total loss. Chang delayed the effect of his ruling to give the city time to appeal, and importantly, emphasized in his ruling that the issue was the fact that the ban was a total one. It even applied to gifts among family members. He specifically left the door open for the city to regulate guns, uh, gun sales in some way short of the complete ban. And elected officials and community activists are already investigating ways that they might do that. And at least for now, the city's ban on assault weapons, which wasn't part of the suit, still stands. Well, on the other good news on this front is that a week before Chang's ruling, U.S. District Judge William Scretney, which I think is a wonderful name, William Scretney upheld most of New York State's toughened gun laws, which were passed in the wake of the Newtown Massacre. The laws banned large capacity magazines and some types of semi-automatic rifles. Scretney said that those provisions are constitutional because they relate to an important government function of public safety. In fact, the only part of the laws he struck down was a provision that banned uh, putting more than seven bullets in a 10-round magazine, which he said was just arbitrary. Second part of the good news on this front is that the day before that New York decision, the New Jersey State Supreme Court turned away a challenge to two of that state's tough gun control laws. These laws required that people show a, quote, justifiable need and, quote, an urgent necessity for self-protection to get a permit in order to carry a concealed weapon. The court found that New Jersey has a well-established record of controlling firearms and that it can place strict requirements on people seeking concealed carry permits. Now, there are two quick final points here before I move away from this whole topic. One is that uh, this whole thing shows the script that the mass media are following in terms of gun control. Uh, the script being where, you know, there's one storyline that gets established that all later stories have to follow. Uh, the thing is, you likely heard more about the Chicago case where the laws were struck down than you did about the New York and the New Jersey cases where they were upheld combined. The other thing here, New Jersey Governor Chris is a 2016 yet Christie, 
uh, continues to say he supports all kinds of gun control laws, but his attorney general refused to defend the two laws in question before the state Supreme Court. All right, going on from there, I'm actually going to spend a couple of minutes talking about two things that I don't normally talk about here. The reason for that is that these are subjects in which I have opinions, in which I have interests, uh, and I have convictions about them. They frankly do not rate very high on my personal list of political and social priorities. So while I have opinions and convictions, I, it's not something I spend a lot of time on. The first of these has to do with religious belief, or rather, the lack of religious belief. Okay, I'm an atheist. Again, it's not something I talk about a lot. It's just what I believe, it's what I'm convinced is true, and, you know, that's that. Now, I've been an atheist almost my entire adult life, uh, after a gradual shift in my thinking that took place over a period of several years. And it is, again, what I believe, what I'm convinced is correct. Uh, and I've known too many people who were actually trapped by their religion into lives of suffering to accept religion as a path for everyone. I have also known too many people in my life for whom their religious convictions provided the basis for a life of justice, dignity, and courage in order to deny religious belief as a path for all. Well, anyway, the point here is that Yes, I'm an atheist. And as an atheist, I'm actually a member of a minority community that is actually subject to prejudice. Survey cited in a recent study out of the University of British Columbia have shown that, over, uh, that out of a list of over a dozen characteristics, being an atheist is the only one where a majority of Americans were willing to say they would not vote for that person for public office on that basis alone, even if they were otherwise qualified. Another study found that atheists are the group that Americans would most disapprove of their children marrying. And still another found that atheists are regarded as criminally untrustworthy to a degree comparable to rapists. Now you could chalk up the extremity of those results uh, to what prejudices uh, people are willing to confess to. But um, the fact is the raw figures still remain. What prompted this, uh, this discussion today actually was an article in Alternet, including what the author felt were the five most notable anti-atheist related stories of 2013. And I wanted to mention one because this is something that for some reason, what I hear people say about atheists, this, this is the one, for some reason, this is the one that really bugs me. It turns out that endurance swimmer Diana Nyand is an atheist. I, I hadn't known that before. Uh, and she said that she's, she sees no contradiction between her atheism and a sense of awe. Or in her words, quote, to weep at the beauty of this universe and be moved by all of humanity. Well, Oprah was having none of that. Well, I don't call you an atheist then, she grandly declared. In other words, he's saying because, because Nyad could experience awe, well, she just couldn't be an atheist. Because apparently atheists have to be cold-hearted rationalists um, who have no room for wonder in their lives. Well, I'm an atheist, and I am constantly awed by nature, the world, the universe, by the whole notion of existence all around me. The incredible complexity of it all, the astonishment of all the interactions. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, try this, okay? Try this. Look out your window at the ground, or the snow if the ground is covered, whichever, it doesn't matter. Think about what's involved in you seeing that. And think about it in every detail. Think about nuclear reactions in the heart of the sun, which produce a photon, and the repeated atomic level reactions, that photon interactions, that photon goes through to get to the surface of the sun, which could take a million years. Then think of that photon propagating out through space as an undulating wave of electromagnetic energy, traveling at the speed of light, and then even at that ultimate speed, the sun is so far away it still takes eight minutes to get here. Think about the electromagnetic and chemical reactions uh, that photon experiences as it moves through the atmosphere to finally strike the ground. Think about the chemical and atomic reactions at the ground with the snow or the ground or the grass, whatever it is that photon strikes, whatever it is you're looking at. 
Those are reactions that resulted in that photon being reflected off that surface with a certain energy level and then traveling as another and doing it by the way while other photons are being absorbed by that same material and then traveling off that again another way through the air through the glass to your eye and then think about the way that light is focused by the lens of your eye, about the biochemical reactions at the retina that produce an electrochemical, uh, a bioelectric signal along your nerves to your brain. And then think about the utter amazing, uh, incredible consciousness that you can actually be aware of whatever it is you're looking at, at its, at its shape, at its color, and even thanks to the wonder of binocular vision, how far away it is. Think about, and that doesn't begin to cover all the details involved. They're all natural processes, not the act of a God involved. And if you don't think that's awesome, Oprah, shove it. All right, one other thing here before we take a break. This has to do with uh, drugs. That's the other thing where, not high in my list, but I do have convictions about it. This is sparked, as I'm sure you guessed, by the fact that Colorado recently legalized the sale of marijuana for recreational use. Now, first things first, it's obvious, it's admitted even tacitly, at least, by our so-called leaders that the war on drugs has been a colossal and abysmal failure uh, that's been a benefit only to the corporations that build and run private prisons, while at the same time needlessly branding tens of thousands of people, most of them minorities, as criminals. Colorado has now legalized weed, and in fact, Washington had already done so, but it's still in the process of establishing a means to legally sell it in the state. In fact, the nation as a whole has gone through a very dramatic change of mind on the issue. As recently as 2005, the Gallup poll had over 60% of Americans opposed to legalizing marijuana. The, most, the last Gallup poll to ask the question, which is this past fall, has 58% approving the legalization of marijuana. Advocates of legalization uh, see possibilities for further legalization based on state level polls in additional 14 states and the District of Columbia over the next few years. Now again, this is not high on my list of priorities, but I have favored the legalization of marijuana again for most of my adult life. I actually have to say, I don't favor the legalization of all drugs. I think we can, as a society, society, legitimately ban the sale of substances that have demonstrated serious dangers. Uh, remember, my generation was the one that came up with the phrase, speed kills. And besides that, yes, I am looking at you, the tobacco and alcohol industries. Uh, and I do think, by the way, we can uh, place some restrictions on the sale of marijuana, for example, to minors. Still, I do admit to being quite pleased by being able to say that marijuana legalization is something that I see is coming, is something that is happening, and that I think, frankly, we're going to be the better for it. Let's take a break. And we're back. Okay, we're going to start the second half of the show with uh, updates and a couple of things I talked about last week. First, Utah. Uh, you undoubtedly heard that the Supreme Court has put a stay on the ruling that the state's ban on same-sex marriage violates the federal constitution. Uh, the stay allows the state to refuse to issue any marriage licenses to same-sex couples, and it's going to stay in place until the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals issues its ruling. Now, that case is on a fast track. The, the, the state of Utah is supposed to file its first briefs by January 27th. However, no date has been set for oral arguments, and it can easily be months before a decision has been handed down. In the meantime, the place that only banned polygamy and plural marriages because it was a requirement to become a state, but now wants to enforce traditional marriage on everyone else, can throw same-sex couples who got married in the interregnum back into the black hole of discrimination as the governor declares the state will not recognize marriages performed in that time. 
The state's request to the Supreme Court went to Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor, who handles emergency appeals from the 10th District. Um, for reasons unknown, but which I suspect was a desire to avoid any flack, she brought the matter to the whole court, which issued an unsigned opinion. So we actually don't know who thought what about the matter. Uh, another update is South Sudan. Now, again, I don't expect I'm going to be spending a lot of time on this because I know most of you, frankly, just aren't going to be interested in it, except in the purely philosophical sense. But um, I do want to give this update. Peace negotiations, if you can call them that, have opened between the government of President Salva Kiir and the rebel forces led by former Vice President uh, Riek Machar. Um, with, please try to contain your surprise, each side demanding that the other make the first move. Uh, the government rejected rebel calls for an immediate release of prisoners who are political supporters of Mishar, uh, people who the government accuses of being involved in a coup. Um, meanwhile, Mishar, whose forces have taken the city of Bor and are reputed to be marching towards the, state ca uh, the, the national capital of Juba, is saying that groups calling for an immediate ceasefire are jumping the gun, which is usually the attitude pay, uh, taken by people who figure that they've got the upper hand. The UN Refugee uh, Agency reports that the conflict, which is only three weeks old, has already displaced 189,000 people. Now, the fighting's been mostly along ethnic lines, but the fact is it appears at root, as often is true, to be a more matter of political power than ethnicity. Another way, it's um, another example of tribal fears and hatreds being exploited for the benefit of the powerful. A reference to tribal things brings us to our third update, Iraq. Uh, since last week, it's become clear that the main forces uh, fighting the Iraqi government in the province of Anbar are from an Islamist group known both as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria and as the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIS or ISIL. Uh, the media is taken to referring to, I'm going to call them ISIS, as affiliated with or connected to Al-Qaeda, which really is just a self description on the part of ISIS, uh, and it's really just symbolic because the group obviously does not take any orders from Ayman al-Zawahiri, who is the head of al-Qaeda. Anyway, uh, in the wake of the anger in the region sparked by Pre uh, Iraqi President Nouri al-Malikai's really ham-fisted uh, arrest of a Sunni lawmaker and breakup of a nonviolent protest camp, ISIS seized and held the centers of the cities of Fallujah, Ramadi, and uh, uh, Khalidiyah. A joint operation by Iraqi troops and local police pushed ISIS out of Khalidiyah um, and much of Fallujah, although parts of Fallujah as well as the city of Ramadi apparently remain in ISIS hands as of today. But now, significantly, Iraq's military and some Sunni tribal leaders have struck a deal under which the government forces are going to withdraw basically sort of like the borders of Anbar province and let tribal forces and local police undertake the effort of pushing ISIS out of these cities. This is significant because, one, it removes government forces from the area and they are a constant symbol, uh, a constant pressure because the mostly Sunni region of, of Anbar does not trust the government which is controlled by Shiites. Also, it politically and, uh, and ethically isolates ISIS. Uh, they're not fighting the government, they're fighting other Sunnis now. And most importantly, most importantly, it means an outbreak of the civil war, which I feared last week, that risk has been cut dramatically. This doesn't change the fact that there's a humanitarian crisis in Anbar. Over 250 people have been killed. It's the worst fighting in, in years. At least 13,000 families have fled uh, uh, Fallujah alone. At least 5,000 have fled the province entirely. There are fears that the continued fighting will hinder uh, uh, refreshing stocks of food, water, and medicine, which are feared to be getting to run out in the region. Sometimes the truth is the only good news is that the news is not as bad as it might have been. But I suppose we'll take what we can get. All right, and that news about Iraq brings us, in fact, straight to one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. This week it's a joint award. The winner of the Big Red Nose this week goes to the right wing's favorite foreign policy bromance, that darling duo of doofishness, Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham.
At a press conference last week, the two tried to blame the fighting in Anbar on, I actually don't have to tell you this, do I? They wanted to blame it on Barack Obama. Why? Because he withdrew U.S. forces from Iraq in 2011 on schedule. That withdrawal created a vacuum, they said, being filled by America's enemies, creating a threat to U.S. national security. Now, the White House said that the U.S. is sending weapons to Iraq, but, but these pairs suggested that's not enough, that the U.S. should take on a more direct role. Now, remember, the first that withdrawal was based on an agreement reached by the Bush administration before Obama was even elected. Uh, Obama administration did everything it could to pressure the Iraqis to change it to let forces stay. There was no Al-Qaeda uh, Al presence in Iraq, uh, uh, no Al-Qaeda presence in Iraq before our invasion. We created Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And during the time there were U.S. troops in, uh, in, in Iraq, Sunni fundamentalists controlled parts of Fallujah on at least three separate occasions. But who cares? History is for wimps. But here's the real reason they got the award. At that same presser, they also slammed the administration's handling of the civil war in Syria, saying, as they have before, that the U.S. should do more to assist the insurgents. In fact, in the past, they've even advocated direct U.S. military action. Okay. One of the strongest rebel groups in Syria, one of the strongest among the rebels that Lin John would have in power in Damascus, is the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, the exact same fundamentalist Muslim group they are saying is creating a, US, a threat to U.S. security in Iraq. They want U.S. forces go, to go to Iraq to fight the same people they want U.S. forces to support in Syria. These people are truly champion clowns. Alright, before I run out of time, let me get to the outrage of the week. Only hours before it was to take effect on January 1st, the Supreme, uh, Supreme Court um, suspended uh, implementation of provision of the Affordable Care Act that would have forced some religious affiliated organizations uh, to allow their employees to access health insurance. That includes birth control. The Affordable Care Act requires that insurance allow for such coverage, but the Obama administration reached an accommodation which allowed religious organizations to say, well, we, don't, we won't do it, but it will, it will be provided at the expense of the insurance company. Well, a Denver group called Little Sisters of the Poor Home for the Aged said that even filing the form to do this is a violation of their religion because it would still allow the insurance company to provide the contraceptive coverage. Now, I have to tell you, this I really find outrageous. It's one thing to argue that religious freedom, uh, that because of religious freedom, you shouldn't have to provide contraceptive care as part of your insurance coverage for your employees. But it's another one to say that you can deny it to them altogether. It's one thing to say that I don't have to pay for it. It's another thing to say I can actively prevent you from getting it. That's when you have crossed the line from, from religious freedom into theocracy. And it is an outrage. All right, last, our weekly reminder. Um, and this is quite possibly going to be our last weekly reminder. This was based on uh, a project done by Slate Magazine, and uh, they shut it down as of December 31st after doing it for the entire year of 2013. But as of December 31st, at least 12,042 Americans had been killed by gunfire in this country since Newtown, at least 98 of them in Massachusetts. And remember, that does not include suicides, which are rarely reported in the media. Citing the most recent Centers for Disease Control estimates for yearly death by guns, it's likely that as of today, as of January, actually, this is actually of January 8th, 2014, roughly 35,871 people have died from gunfire in the U.S. since the Newtown shootings. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. Peace.